even when they brought in the troops, the troops could not get the mail out. During the seven days of the strike, everyone was listening to their radios or their t TVs. On the last day, they had Mo out in front of the post office here at GPO. America in 1970, 24 years ago, was a time of political turmoil and demands for social change. The civil rights movement, the women's movement, and other grassroots forces formed in the belief that social and economic justice were things that could be obtained. The people were on the march, literally. There were stirrings even in the Postal Service, where for almost 200 years, Workers had toiled for low pay in poor conditions. Though few realized it, even here, the times were changing. Though few saw it coming, pent-up resentments were about to break out. Ominous rumblings had been heard for many months. Long-suffering postal workers were driven past desperation. Actually, in about July, early July of 1969, that was the first warning that we had a uh, small post office in the Bronx, Kingsbridge, po Kingsbridge Post Office, had about 20 clerks and about 50 letter carriers, and they were out on a one-day wildcat walkout. The postal worker grievances were real. Even post office authorities conceded that postal workers had been shortchanged in federal pay increases. In 1970, pay scales started at a meager $6,176 and rose to $8,442 after 21 years of service. Take New York City, for example. There, in 1970, according to the federal government, it took an annual income of more than $11,000 for a family of four to maintain a moderate living standard in New York. At that time, a postal worker with 20 years of service was making barely $8,000 a year. And I came in with a big salary of $1.61 an hour. And when I was a part-time flexible, I worked anywhere between 130 and 140 hours uh, every two weeks. I worked about 12 hours every day and I worked uh, usually 12 days in a row and then had two days off. My first full-time check was $104 and my house payment was 101 <laughs> and I didn't know what I was going to do with the extra three dollars but things were really tough at that point you know. Well let me take you back even to when I started in the 50s, 1950s. Started at $1.21 an hour, no overtime and management would tell you you had no privileges no rights and damn few privileges. And when the mail trucks come in, they'd call you, you sit in the swing room off the clock. And when the mail trucks come in, they call you, ring in, you go and work that mail up, and they say, ring out. You go back there and sit till some more mail come in. If you didn't like it, you could go home and stay. They didn't care. But that's the way we worked. No overtime until about 1966, 68. Straight time, got paid twice a month. Didn't have none of the benefits that we have now uh, that we received after the Postal Reorganization Act, and we went under Taft-Hartley. Uh, you're talking about tough. Most memorable factor was the 23 years that it took to get to, to top pay grade. In those days, we didn't have collective bargaining. Uh, we had collective begging. We had to go to Congress for raises. Uh, it must be remembered by everybody that those days there was no collective bargaining. When you wanted a pay raise, you had to go the legislative route. You could be standing in line to report to work and they could tell you to go home. You didn't have an eight-hour guarantee on your day off. Uh, they would call you in and send you home before you even punched in. Uh, once you punched in, you had a four-hour guarantee. But there was just all kinds of game playing. Many issues over time bad grievance procedures, not handling grievances, not taking care of employee problems, bad parking uh, problems in the Postal Service, uh, all sorts of health and safety issues that today 
are resolved. The pay was very poor. Uh, uh, if, if you were the sole support of a family, you really couldn't make it on postal wages without maybe even having welfare assistance. A lot of postal employees received welfare. On March 12, 1970, after many delays and broken promises, postal workers heard that the House Post Office and Civil Service Committee had finally approved a measly 5.4 percent postal wage increase. This was the straw that broke the camel's back. In New York City, postal workers demanded a vote to strike, and all hell broke loose. Shortly after midnight, pickets were outside post offices. The strike that couldn't happen did. Now on the web for the next few days, we'll be cabin pickets now. And on that night of March 12th, I got a report that the letter carriers had voted to take a strike vote in Manhattan Center on March 17th of 1970. I realized then that if the carriers voted to go out on strike, we would not, under my leadership, cross those picket lines or anything. I'd never seen so many people out in front of this. Just had the whole street blocked up. So they took us around to the alley and took us in the back and took us up the freight elevator. And we walked in that auditorium up on that stage, looked like I'd never seen that many people. Those individuals were uh, the true essence of labor being expressed. Uh, they had a driving uh, desire uh, that they weren't going to put up for what they have been putting up with. Uh, it was like a carnival, actually, in the street because the employees never been on a strike, particularly involved in an illegal strike as this was, not recognizing that we were almost immediately placed on the, under an order to go back to work with a threat of a hundred thousand dollar a day fine which we didn't couldn't have paid anyway but uh... the employees uh... walked out they locked the post office completely up the postmaster came out and asked me was it okay to lock the post office and i said well it's your post office all the elected officers were hiding from subpoenas so i was answering phones all day i remember for example that i was told that you know you're a veteran and you'll lose all your your veterans benefits and your pension, you lose everything if you strike, because that's un-American. You know, we all knew that we weren't supposed to strike from the government, but the point of it was, it's like I said, it was a spontaneous thing, it's just something that just happened. Most of us didn't expect to return to work. We thought that uh, we would lose our jobs, but things would be better for those who replaced us. I really think that the Postal Service was so surprised that they didn't have time to take action. I'm going to really be frank with you. Uh, they, they really didn't have time to zero in on uh, it. It was just that quick. The logistics of the strike weren't planned because we didn't really know when it would occur. We knew that we would support it if it did. And that's where we were in St. Paul. It took guts to do what they did. Strikes against the government are illegal. Each worker walking out would be liable to a fine of as much as $1,000 a jail sentence of up to a year and a day, and automatic loss of his or her job. The judge had threatened, I think, with personal fines of a thousand, uh, two thousand, three thousand, you know, graduated on a daily basis, and the union ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand, forty thousand each day. But once we were out, we were determined nothing was going to turn us around. Christ came, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, good union men will not cross picket lines. Then the chair went up and the meeting broke up. That was it. Within three days, it was a national crisis, threatening economic chaos. For 14 million people in the New York metropolitan region alone, the strike interrupted the flow of everything from dividend and paychecks to wedding invitations and love letters. As far as New York was concerned, I would say it was shut down undoubtedly 99%, even the press said kind of 